Um, I so I just wanted to start off by saying some of the best advice I ever got was um, to think when we're thinking of our children to think of them and they'll always be our children, right? Not in terms of whether they're brilliant, whether they're cognitive capable, whether they're whatever their IQ is, but to assume competency and that when you um, address them or interact with them in a manner that is competent and it's not brilliant and it, um, that they will respond. And I have always found that to be true with my son who's 38. Um, respond in a positive way and you may realize that there's much higher cognition going on than anything else. And that's always the advice I give to parents when I um, talk to them and with professionals and educators. So idea, which we've gone over numerous times here, wasn't um, in a, didn't become law until 1975. I just interviewed a 61 year old man who's living with his 81 year old mother and when he was in middle school, the school system said, we have the perfect program for you, but there's a waiting list. So you can't go to school. We don't have anything for you. You know, and that's not that long ago, right? So we now have a law that says, regardless of what your disability is, um, you are entitled to go to school, to a free and appropriate education. However, as a matter of law, students are expected, and they're supposed to start at the grade level of general education classroom that is age appropriate for them. Amy, did you want to talk yes. about what we go ahead? Sure. I'll just speak briefly to this. I know we touched upon it at our last um, presentation. Um, we just, you know, again, self-explanatory, what's on the screen, there's obviously different types of settings and schools that um, our, our children can go to. Um, it's basically, you need to think about like with your family and with your child and with some team members that um, you've trust, like which setting is best for your child, because it's really different depending on where you live um, and who works with your child and the school systems themselves. So obviously private, um, there are private establishments. There are multiple kinds of private establishments. There are inclusion settings. There are self-contained setting, settings. Um, there are private schools for special education that are um, more targeted to specific disabilities. I know in Connecticut, we have multiple schools specifically targeting children with dyslexia. Um, they will not accept children who are nonverbal. They will not accept children who um, have intellectual disabilities. They will not accept children who have behavioral problems. So, and again, then there's other schools targeting children who have what I just mentioned. So the private school, some people love that word and think that it's going to like answer all their or solve all their problems, but it really depends on what type of private school um, and, and how they can help your child. Um, Self-contained means that there are no typical peers in the classroom. It's just children who have special needs. Um, and uh, some school districts that are public have one or two classrooms within the public school setting that are considered self-contained classrooms. So there's like a, there's a big web here. Some states find it illegal now to have public schools with self-contained classrooms. So it's really, it depends on your state, like we've always said. Um, but again, just get your, you know, find out what's out there, um, ask questions. I lived in a really small town in Darien and I had a mom who was there for 10 years and she had no idea that there was a self-contained classroom in Darien, which is a tiny town because it's not talked about. So, you know, just ask those questions, find out what's out there. And lastly, um, IEPs versus service plans. Um, uh, IEPs are um, individualized education plans, and it's when a child has a specific disability that's been identified, and it means that they're not able to access the general edu education curriculum without specialized instruction based on their diagnosed disability, which comes from, as you knew from our last presentation, a lot of assessments and testing and um, parameters comparing um, children, comparing to children who are of the same age norm or grade norm. Um, service plans and Susan, if I'm in, in Connecticut, we call them 504 plans. I'm assuming that's kind of the same. It's basically when you don't have a specific or you may have a specific disability identified, or maybe you have a medical condition like ADHD identified, but you're not necessarily not able to access the curriculum without individualized instruction, but you maybe need accommodations. So extra time on tests, separate setting, um, 
a, the ability to have movement breaks throughout the day. But again, you're you're not far enough behind the general like, curriculum that you need that specialized instruction. I think. Yeah, in Maryland, our five, a 504 just says you need accommodations to access the general cu curriculum. A service plan is a watered down IEP that has to be implemented. If, if the school system, well, even if you choose, but if the school system especially decides that they will pay for you to go to a private school, then they might just give you a service plan, okay. which is just kind of a mini one. I don't think there's any one thing that varies more state to state, right? Because I know it's different in California, Sue, and yeah, um, California's 504 plans. Yeah, I've never even heard of the term service plan, so I don't, I don't know. We've got health plans, but not service plans. Yeah. What about you, Beth? What's up and happening up in Maine? 504. I don't 504. know anything about service plans. Okay. Yeah, it's, and I know that um, Sam has Crohn's disease as well, and I know that a lot of more typical kids that might have Crohn's disease, for instance, have 504 plans, and there's a lot of controversy about whether they should just go with a health plan or a 504, and it's usually lots of advice to do the 504 because that's more guaranteed under the law. Yeah, it's also cheaper probably too for the system, right? I don't know. I'm a, I'm a bit of a cynic at this point in my life, but anyway. <laughs> um, all right, so I this is something I haven't gone over before. Um, Idea has basically 13 disability categories, and just as and, and just as we learn something, we learn something new. Amy told us that dyslexia is now it's only um, it's a self-contained. Um, disability category. Was that where you are now or where you were, Amy? No, it was, um, honestly, I'm so new to Rhode Island. I don't even know the disability okay. categories here, but in Connecticut, I believe it was two years ago, Connecticut passed a law that dyslexia is now its own category of a disability. It does, it's not under something else. It stands. And alone. that's basically our reading disability. And Sue, you said they almost got it through in California, but didn't quite happen, right? No, oh, because there nobody had programs to be able to support it, so they shelved it until they could get the programs into all the schools. Okay, so yeah, I is I, usually my experience has been, and I bet you all agree, is that when obviously there's something going on, it's just a, very definitely a disability, but um, it's not dramatic. That we'll look at something like at a learning disability, and usually we're reading dyslexia, the math and the written expression. So the other categories are other health impairment. That's usually where ADHD comes under, executive function, um, autism, ASD, um, speech and language impairment, and orthopedic impairment. Um, and of course, the largest disability area is the intellectual disability. Um, technically, you have to have an IQ below 70 to qualify for an intellectual disability. I think that becomes more important in the adult service world than in the education world. I think we're a little bit more to look at gray areas there. And those are determined through standard IQ testing are usually the whisk and the waist, which is the Weschler intelligence thing and other. And then there's the I don't remember what they are. Um, and then there's nonverbal intelligence tests, which are basically language tests. And I know in the adult world, at least in uh, Developmental Disability Administration, the tri-state um, area around D.C., these adaptive assessments are becoming more and more critical to determining the level of services as an adult. So those who may not seem like they are severely disabled, if their adaptive assessments, which are their practical life skills, are significantly impacted, then it um, increases the chance of getting more support services. Is that true where you guys are, Any? I, I'm not, I'm so far away from that. I feel like I can't speak to it. I'm not in the adult world yet. <laughs> yeah. I would say in Maine, I don't, Sam had some kind of an, an assessment when he was 18 and, and 
entering the adult world, but otherwise, I don't think, I think we just, it doesn't go like that. Yeah, we had to have the assessment before she was 18 to qualify for regional support services, which right. gave her. Yeah. Right, right. Um, I wanted to say one thing, uh, Susan, that yeah. I know I mentioned, um, and now, of course, I've just lost my Zoom, so I don't know who I'm looking at, but um, uh, I was letting you know that, um, and again, this could be a Connecticut thing, but one disability category that we didn't touch upon that most, that Jack has, and most of my Connecticut clients have, who are, um, who have genetic mutations like ours, uh, the category is, it's not ID, it, it's multiple disabilities. Um, right. And so it, it kind of, in some ways, the districts push for kids like Jack to get that label, mainly because it kind of is a bigger, it's a broader range of like options for the child. And also sometimes in certain states, Connecticut included, the children can get more through insurance companies if that's their disability category, as opposed to something like ID, intellectual disability. So right. I don't know if that's everybody, but. I am. kind of, um, we're in, we're in Missouri and my son's IEP is labeled multiple disabilities. Okay. Okay. Um, I, that's why I added it on here after. after oh, sorry. No, no, no. That's right. That's fine. But, right. um, I know in Maryland, you have to have a primary disability, but they will also list sometimes the other areas affected by the disability. And that's where sometimes you can get into these other things. And it's funny because then as in the adult world, in Maryland, DC and Virginia, you can have multiple disabilities, but the IEP is always identifies a primary disability. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, and then and that just goes to show you the inconsistencies we have even under the federal laws that dictate this. Um, yeah, more disabilities, the better in terms of getting services, if that's what you are looking for. Right. right. Um, so some of the ones that I saw listed for were for vision because of feeding, and that gets into your adaptive skills, reading, math, written, transition, employment, independent living, fine gross motor skills, speech, and language. So sometimes... If you uh, there is one disability, but it just has a minor effect in other areas, but it's not a true speech and language disability, it might be listed this way. I don't think it really matters. I think it's, that's what we all came up to with this is mm -hmm. your disability should not drive the services you get. It's your level of need that should drive it. Um, the U.S. Department of Education has stated originally that um, an individualized education program must be aligned to the content standards for the grade in which a student is enrolled. So if you're a high school age student who is reading an elementary school level, your IEP is supposed to be connected to the high school standards that meet his grade level, not his their, or hers cognitive level or achievement level. Technically, that's true. Okay, the way to get a rat, this can be a very good thing for some people. The way, so, but it also allows this loophole, and this is different state by state. Um, students who have a significant cognitive disability are allowed to be measured against what are called alternative achievement standards. And each state can develop whatever they want, whatever those standards are. What I thought was interesting is that the states have a cap of 1% of all students yeah. who can um, fail who cannot pass those tests, which is in some ways makes sense because it's proportion to the um, population of a state. In other ways, I think it's rather arbitrary. Um, I, I personally kind of liked that these two standards were there because we have CAT6 individuals who are obviously very bright, have high IQs, may be nonverbal, may have a very hard time demonstrating their cognition. So aligning the state standards, their grade level standards, is a way of making sure that your school system, wherever they're going to school, um, is educating them at a level that they're ready to, to learn at. By the same token, for my son, for example, um, 
I do think probably cognitively he was able to far more intelligent than he could ever demonstrate. But his skills for independent living were so intense um, that it was more much more appropriate for him to work on those alternative achievement standards, which actually didn't even exist when he was in high school. Anybody have thoughts on this, Sue, Amy, Beth? I mean, this, you guys I, in line, I mean. I feel like for, again, I, I have a little one, um, but for me, like when I, when I was teaching and I learned about what you just said, Sue, about aligning the goals and objectives to, you know, uh, we call them common core standards and all this sort of stuff. Thinking about Jack, like he is, he's a seven and a half year old in a one-year-old body or mind. So like how the heck are we supposed to write goals around like reading comprehension when he doesn't even know that things form letters like at all. Um, so it, it's like a, I like the fact that Jack's IEP doesn't speak to academics at all because he can't learn academically right now. He needs to learn how to move his body and he needs to learn how to pick up a cup to drink from it. So for him, I don't mind that it's not academically challenging, but I can totally see the other side of it. Whereas if you are intellectually able, it is more, it gives you a better chance to succeed with your IEP meeting these standards. So I don't know. That's what I really particularly like about our group is because then I just look next door to you at Sue and Kristen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to me, Kristen's a great example of someone who really, I, I'm guessing because I don't know for a fact, Sue, but I'm thinking she probably really was a good candidate for the for the grade level standards, modified, supported what in a whatever way. But certainly she is far more independent than many cat six individuals yes yes she did enter school completely nonverbal. um we were lucky she did develop speech and language and it came fairly fast over the years but we, our biggest problem was the school district wanted to put her in you know the capsule of intellectual disability and I fought it tooth and nail. I got an advocate and went to town and we got her disability label as <laughs> orthopedic impairment because of all of her other medical stuff with a secondary of speech and language. It opened her up to a whole spectrum of different classes, more mainstreaming for her, more inclusion. And that's when the door got open more for her. But we had to fight it. We fought and I fought. guess this was something that we have, we've, you know, we've gone over a lot of these topics repeatedly in the last few years, but I really felt this was something we hadn't um, touched on too much, is that there are options for either way for, for CAT6 families. And I think we have such a huge spectrum within the CAT6 disability area that um, it's important for parents to know that, that there are tools out there for you to find the kind of education that your child will do best with and can achieve that. Mm -hmm. Which leads us to goals and objectives, which are really mm -hmm. how you make that happen. So I think you, Sue, I think yours are the first set and then Amy, you are on the second set. Mm -hmm. So I'll Well, you. and my goals are aligning with state standards and making sure that that state standard is addressed as part of the goal. No matter how low the child is achieving, I mean, if you've got a, a child um, in third grade and they're just learning to identify letters, you still have to write that standard to the third grade standards. But how you're going to get them from the point that they're at to, quote, approach the standard, they're not going to meet the standard, but they're going to approach the standard. So one of the examples I had was moving towards meeting grade level standards in language arts specifically standard, and this was R1 for informational text, and this is based on California standards, identifying key ideas and details in text, Tom will be able to demonstrate comprehension of a passage read to him by pointing to the correct picture when given three choices for four out of five questions for five different passages. That, the way that is written, makes sure that it's not random guessing. 
because he's had three choices. He has to do it for four out of five questions and he has to do it on five different passages. So there's no chance that guessing his got him the, to meet the goal. It also is taking into account here, he's pointing because he is potentially nonverbal or severely speech and language impaired that he can't give that answer. You know, the other, the other way to do that if he's able to identify words is to give three word strips. But at this goal, I put that he would identify the correct picture. Okay. Um, the goal is measurable. It works on state standards as all the regular education students are. And it takes into account any expressive language issues that the child may have. That's super important, especially with most of our kids that have got speech and language problems is that you have in all of their academic goals, address that speech and language piece. You're, you're not gonna have them orally recite something to you because they can't. So you've gotta make sure you address that. Um, I put a second one in. Uh, Tom will be able to demonstrate understanding of the organization and basic features of print, reading standard RF for foundational skills. When given cards with individual letters on them, Tom can pick up and show the teacher the correct card for the verbal letter given for 25 out of 26 letter cards. And again, for no guessing, it's over three consecutive attempts in three days. You've totally defined how he's going to meet that goal. He may be starting out with two out of 26 letters for two days. But the goal is to move towards 25 out of 26. Again, here you've taken into the effect, effect that the child is potentially nonverbal. And you can move it up a level by saying, um, demonstrate their understanding. You can change it to letter sound when the goal is met for identifying letter names. As a special education teacher and a resource specialist writing goals till I was blue in the face, I always wanted to make sure that my goals for all of my students were obtainable. I didn't want to make them too lofty that they can't meet them within a year. And I don't want to minimalize it. You never want to minimalize it and assume that they can't do it and make it too small. So I, you've got to know the child that you're writing the goals for. If you don't, well, then you're, you're taking your best guess, but in all of my students, I always wanted to make sure that I was giving them the maximum that I could in every goal that we did. Any questions there on goals? No, so I thought those were really good examples. Um, it's really an art to um, to figure out how to do this. But you know, it's, it, but it's a good thing too. I mean, I, I don't want to diminish that. But then we have the other side where Amy wrote these goals, which I think really gave good examples of someone who it wasn't appropriate to write goals tied to the state um, course, right? Yep. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. So he's, cause he's technically in second grade. Um, so no, he's not, uh, you know, doing anything that a second grader can do. Um, so uh, his IEP, these are copied and pasted from his IEP. So um, his IEP is still broken down um, into technically academics and communication and fine motor and gross motor, much like all the rest. But the academics are more, as you can see, like functional um, as opposed to like reading and writing and math. Um, so Jack has an AAC device. It's an eye gaze device. Um, it me it's basically what you all picture like if you're like typical kid not typical children who are nonverbal but who have more of an intellectual ability and who have uh, better fine motor skills typically will use an iPad to communicate. Jack cannot do that because he doesn't have use of his hands. Well, he does, but he doesn't use them appropriately, so he can't touch an iPad. Uh, so the next and I was tired of carrying around those big switches and all that sort of fun stuff. So we decided to um, was like, I'm with you, Amy. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I can't can't do this anymore. Um, and so we thought an eye gaze was a better option for him because it's one device. It looks like an iPad. It has the same setup as all those iPads you've seen with the the icons and the whatever you're all you, you know you've all seen it but all he has to do is look at it and when he looks at it and focuses on whatever the, the picture is it says it out loud much like if you were to touch it um so anyway as you can see from this goal 
um, he will use any means possible because one day we hope he does touch that screen. So the screen is touchable. It's not just eye gaze. So either an uh, eye gaze, a uh, different AAC device, whether it be a switch, if the teachers want to use a switch or a touch, um, he's going to demonstrate pre-academic skills by completing the following. And the objectives is where it really breaks down, like what, what they're asking him to do. Um, so they wanted to really try to get him to establish routines throughout his day. So um, like initiating a step. So uh, for example, uh, one thing they were working with him on was, um, um, sorry, I'm like trying to picture his day. Um, uh, when he had to get ready to go to his therapy session, the first thing they did was go to the bathroom, uh, change his diaper. So he, they wanted him when they told him that it was time to go to PT and they would have a symbol schedule for him and they showed him the PT, you know, they wanted him to initiate that first step by like finding on the eye gaze device, like PT, and then finding on the eye gaze device, like bathroom, like it's basically, it was like a step-by-step -step process to get him to understand like the steps to take to complete something. That's probably a silly example, but you get the gist. Um, obviously as Sue mentioned, you know, they were using pre and post baseline data. Uh, they, you know, you always want your goals and objectives to be measurable, um, and, uh, within a certain time frame. So they gave his year goal, which is 2024, which is when his IEP year ends. Um, and then another example was just, uh, given a functional object, they wanted him to match the item to the picture. Um, so if he saw like, you know, if there was a spoon they want because they were trying to train him to use the eye gaze device and it's hard to like look at a picture of a spoon on a computer and know that it's a spoon if you don't know what a spoon is so they were always trying to give him the tangible object and then like show him this is how we eat and then show him the um show him the picture so sorry i'm kind of talking in circles here but <laughs> no and i find i find this fascinating because i have never i don't think i've ever seen anybody use an eye gaze it's iPad pretty cool i think most patients that I've come across in my career as an educator that have used one have been, have, have had like cerebral palsy or like where they're literally right. like, you know, they're non-ambulatory. They can't use their right. hands. They can't. So Jack is different because he can, like Jack can walk. He can use his hands. He, 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 he it's not like he can't, but he doesn't use them with a purpose. They're so not it's, functional. they're not functional. He eats them. He eats his hands. He like hits himself in the head. He stims. Like he doesn't, you know, he doesn't pick up a pencil. So yeah, it's a, it's a really, and it's hard to write IEP goals because that's another thing that I struggled with his team and I really respect his team. It's hard to write a goal around something that you have absolutely no idea if the child is even going to respond to it. Like they had no idea if this AAC device was appropriate. I mean, they tried, they, they worked on it for a year before writing goals, but again, with Jack and with a lot of our kids, like we have no idea what to expect from them. So as Sue said, you want them to be, you know, not too easy, not too hard. You need to like push them, but challenge them, but then also meet them at their, it's hard with a kid like Jack, because we have no idea what he knows one day and doesn't know the next. So it's like a How tricky. How accurately does he use the eye gaze, Amy? I mean, if you're asking me as mom, I'm so critical. I'm going to tell you he uses it horribly. It's awful. I don't ever see him use it appropriately. However, that's me and I'm not a speech pathologist. His team claims at school, uh, he uses it probably like 50% of the time appropriately, um, depending on the setting. So like a little thing they're working on is at morning meeting. Do you guys remember morning meeting? It's like little kindergarten, you know, yeah. they want every kid to say their name when it's their turn to introduce themselves. And, you know, the kids were in a circle and it was like Jack's turn to say his name and they didn't give him any prompting. And they claim almost like 80%, you know, they have their data 80% of the time when it was his turn, nobody touched him. Nobody said anything to him. He found yeah. I am Jack with his eye gaze and the computer said, I am Jack. So like they were like trying to incorporate it as part of like his daily routine. I don't know. I have a hard time. Like I ask him questions on it. Yes or no questions. I'm like, do you even, I don't know. I'm just very critical. It's interesting. It's interesting. Cause I do think it is, that is something new that I think a lot of parents We'll be interested in it. We probably haven't probably refined that as much as we can. I think yeah. you had some more goals here. Oh, yes. Amy. This is, uh, sorry, you guys can read these. I don't want to take up to, it's just, um, the first one was using his AAC. They just wanted him to um, uh, just have more opportunities to be exposed to different language. That is a beauty of an eye gaze device and an iPad. 
is um, some of the um, programs on it. You can have such a robust vocabulary and language, even if you are you know, completely nonverbal and a non-reader, you can add as many, like um, one of Jack's pages on his eye gaze is family. And it's like everybody we know in the family and I took pictures of them and then the pictures are on the eye gaze. So like things like that. So just increasing vocabulary. Um, and then the last one was like a gross motor goal. So the biggest part of Jack's IAP are fine motor and gross motor goals. Um, and as you can read, it's just, they want him to be able to take steps without a, um, without a, without a walker. Um, so again, Jack's goals are not academic, um, at all, but they are pre-academic and they are functional. So meeting his needs where he is. And I want to say I, for saying it was very, very similar. No eye gaze, of course, back in those <laughs> days, we spent a long, long time getting the point. Oh my gosh. Yes. But he has it. <laughs> so it did come. But the eye gaze, I wonder if that would have helped. But he he was very, very similar, I think, to Jack. So it's just that was more what, the, the, what the extreme difference can be in our kids. Mm -hmm. We one took a connect four game and we um, put different letters or different words in each of the circles. I mean, we had to make our own ones. And that was back when facilitated communication was also the big buzzword at the time. But we did, here's the story I always tell is one day, um, Warren had two things he loved, his roller coaster and his rocking chair. It was a little to carry around rocking chair he could take. Um, and his sister was young. And so for some reason, they had both gotten locked in the basement. And when she put, and all day long, he just kept pointing at R and R, R and R. And I had no idea what it was. When she finally went to bed and I unlocked the basement door, he went flying down and came up with his roller coaster and rocking chair. And that was my first clue into, let's assume competency here, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I, it was, it was, it really was changing for us. Not that he could spell or write or do anything big, but he had a, a level of understanding. Somebody did write me um, and ask about different AAC devices. Mm -hmm. So I just put this link in here. I'm not going to click on it now because I will probably never get back to the slideshow <laughs> if I do that, but it's there. Um, all right, Amy, advocacy. Oh, oh yes. Um, so hold on, I'm just going to pull up my own screen because I have a few extra notes. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go back. If you had other things you no, wanted no, to good. say. No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. We're, we're good. Um, so I've shared this before, um, in our last presentation, um, Again, I think you all corrected me. FERPA may be a Connecticut term. <laughs> so um, I apologize if nobody knows what I'm talking about. But um, in Connecticut, it's the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And it's basically essentially the, uh, the law that a parent or a guardian has the, rights, has the right to view and see anything done with the child in the school, e even so far as email exchanges. Um, there's been some pushback recently with school districts are saying emails are taken out of FERPAs now, um, but some districts are still allowing emails to, meaning emails, um, emails between staff about your child. So uh, this was a big point of, um, a big issue a couple years ago, many years ago, because um, like for child find, like if a parent would say to a teacher, what do you mean you're just bringing my child up for the idea of special education? They're in fifth grade. How did nobody notice this? Parents were actually kind of catching the schools because they were able to ask for the FERPA and they would see emails that were exchanged years earlier between teachers being like, I'm really worried about Jack. And the other teacher was like, oh, whatever. Like it was, I don't know. I mean, we hope teachers don't do that, but it's happened sometimes. Um, so just, you can always ask for a FERPA. If it's not called FERPA in your state, find out what it's called. You have the right to view your, everything about your child. Um, keep a journal. Um, I, I know things are not really on paper anymore. I, I go back and forth. I have a giant binder for Jack that's like this thick and he's only seven. I can't imagine what you ladies have for your older. I mean, it, it makes my head spin. So, so I, I kind of digital now, like I have folders on my computer and my Google drive. So just whatever works for you. Um, Susan made a really good point. Like it's not just school stuff. It could be doctor's appointments, meetings, um, you know, anything that just like, just have something of a place of record for your kid wherever that is. 
Um, so yeah, you don't have to keep it in a binder or I did write online. Okay. See, I was thinking online folder. Um, I always, every time I have a conversation with Jack's school, his past schools, I follow up with an email afterward because in my experience as an advocate, you want everything down in writing. So even if it's something silly, like the other day we had to talk about Jack getting water by mouth throughout the day because he has dry mouth. I followed up with an email and I was like, just to remind you of our conversation, you should be giving Jack water by mouth. You know, it seems so silly, but just follow up. Um, so if you hire an advocate, uh, you want to make sure that she or he reviews everything about your child. Give them that binder or that online binder. Um, develop your questions. Um, always ask questions. I always go into meetings with questions. I highlight anything I don't understand and I make them tell me. Um, I often suggest as a parent to be your best child's advocate by preparing a parent statement for a, um, an IEP meeting. It can be very simple, positives, concerns, what you hope to get out of the meeting. Um, it just sort of sets the tone with the school that you are a team, but you also know your child best. Um, I often email that statement to these schools afterward to keep it on record. Um, and then, um, and Sue made a good point about this, you do have to let the school know in advance or it can't be considered legal, but record your IEP meetings. Even if you think you have a great relationship with the school and everything's great, a lot of times my family say to me, oh, I don't want to record. I don't want the school to get mad at me. You know, I don't want to make it seem like I'm out to get them. And that's not the point, right? Like recording a meeting is just so that if you ever rethink something down the road and you're like, wait, what was said? What did I say about that? Um, it's, if you have it on record, you can go back and listen. There's a great app right now out there that I have all my clients download. I can tell you it's called otter.ai and it provides a transcript for you after the recording is done. So you don't have to sit there and listen. If you're confused, you can just go back and read the transcript. It's pretty awesome. Um, so I recommend doing that. I think that's all I have. I just, you know, you said, Amy, you want to wonder how you have a binder. I think we had Sue and Beth and I probably have file cabinets full. But I also have one folder, one folder where I keep the doctor's letters, the most important documents, all right? That's the one that I can always put my hands on at all times. It's the one I always have to refer back to when they want documentation. For example, I we got a letter today from Social Security and said, based on my request to have my daughter's direct um, SSI direct deposit changed to another bank, they will do that. I never sent that request in. I mm. never did that. Somebody has hacked into her account. I will have to be down at Social Security oh. next week to discuss it. Um, but I will also be bringing that folder with me that has the guardianship papers that has all the critical things. So I think you need everything and then you need a mini folder of the really vital important things. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would agree with that. And I, I have to say that I am very thankful that I saved and I was vigilant about getting the paper records, especially medical records mm -hmm. back before there were any portals and electronic medical records. So I do have that and it's organized and you're right, it's file cabinet. I, I don't actually have a file cabinet, but boxes. Yeah. Um <clears throat> and I you know, I think we can wrap this up pretty quickly because we're just preaching to each other here. <laughs> um as you get it, you know, entitled up until you're 21. Everybody is entitled to a free and appropriate education. After that, you're eligible for services. And that can be a huge difference in justifying your eligibility. Um, you know, transition starts illegally, I think, in most states around age 14. But it's never too early to think about how are the goals that I'm working on today going to serve my child in the adult world? Um, you have this... Again, yeah, Amy, I, I, I'm not clicking on any links. Don't click, don't click on it. Back. I'll show you something. It's, I mean, again, we're preaching to each other here, but I just wanted right. to basically that document, again, it's Connecticut. So read it if you want. Uh, I think it's like 96 pages, but it talks a lot about transition planning and how to best prepare because I have a few 14 year old <laughs> clients and the parents are like, Amy, I don't even know where to begin with transition planning. My kid's 14. Like, what are you talking about? And so that that document really helps them sit down and think about like, what what do I have to think about to even think about? Um, it, like, 
it's a nice document, but this is a, a, a free, um, nope, it's a, a snapshot, if you will, from the document that we've created in my agency. It's basically, it talks about the different areas. So obviously look at the top that's highlighted. So this one is acquiring skills to transition to maybe a two or four year college. And you would look down to see possible objectives or possible things to work on if that's your goal. A second area is self-advocacy. So maybe this is what your focus is. You want your child to you know, have a better communication and learning style, academic behavioral needs. Maybe that's what you want to focus on. Again, a third area, again, you can read it, but organizational skills, study skills. So it really kind of targets every type of um, client or um, person, an individual. Uh, daily living skills. This is what I think about for Jack. I'm like, this is where I'm going to focus when he's 14, like most likely, unless a miracle happens. Um, uh, community partnership. So maybe you're wanting to, uh, I don't even, I've never even read this one. Oh, go to a restaurant. A set, yeah. So, so things like that. So it's just kind of a cheat sheet to, for some parents just to like really get their brain starting to think about what are types of goals that the school should be writing for my child around transition planning and how can I be involved? I remember okay. somebody asking me about the transition and it was overwhelming, but then, then they asked me to visualize what would I imagine his life to be when he was 25, which didn't seem, that was 10 years. So that, that was doable and thinkable. Mm -hmm. That, that was a good, good way to look at things. Yeah. Because then you have to think about living, doing, school's done. What what are what are you thinking his life would be like? So that's a good place to start when mm -hmm. it's so overwhelming. You know, it's funny. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Sue. Kristen, Kristen, we kept all of her goals through high school on the academic train. When she hit her senior year and we knew she was going to do four years post-secondary, still attached to the school district, but out of high school, then we moved to survival skills, everyday skills, taking the bus, ordering off. Of, we did all of those things at that point for her. She still went to community college um, and took the... DSP, the disabled students program classes that she could take, but through the high school district and the services that she was provided for post-secondary, they were all life skills. But that's when we changed hers. And she's different than a lot of cat six kids. Mm -hmm. um, there is nothing more challenging for a parent of a person with a disability than transition. It's like learning um, a language, a new language, mm -hmm. and you're deaf. It's mm -hmm. just the terms, the terminology, the restrictions. <clears throat> I do transitioning youth fairs for several of the um, counties in our state, and um, it's just overwhelming. It really is. So, it, and and the discrepancy is huge. In my county, we have a transition teacher at every high school. In the county next door, there's one transition teacher for every four high schools. So. Um, I think what, what we're all saying is there's, it, it really isn't ever too soon to start looking at what happens, what as they say, when the school bus starts coming, it stops coming. I, this is just what I wanted to say at the end. Um, sometimes it's not what your child is being taught, where your child is being taught, but who is teaching your child. The best help for your child is having them learn an environment where the staff have high expectations for your child and are kind, supportive, and understanding. That doesn't always happen in the least restrictive environment closest to home. Sometimes it's a self-contained class is a better option, sometimes a private school, sometimes a homeschool. 